One of the more irritating problems about space travel is that if you want to get up to decent speeds, you need to burn huge amounts of fuel. Not just the fuel to get the ship up to speed, but the fuel to get the rest of the fuel up to speed. It is a losing battle, even if you have the source of super fuels like fusion or antimatter. Way back at the end of the first year of the channel, I mentioned an alternative to that, and also one that can hypothetically be done without any new science at all, even fusion, something I normally take for granted whenever discussing anything involving travel to other solar systems. We covered it rather hastily so I thought it was time to look at it in more detail. The strange thing about a lot of the earliest episodes is that I often cover the most practical options in those, in abridged form, then cover the less practical options in more detail in later episodes. It seemed a good time to correct that. The funny thing is, it doesn't sound terribly practical, building a highway between stars, and of course we're not talking about a literal highway, that's simply an analogy, and in some ways a river might have been a more apt one since we'll essentially be talking about sailing between stars using actual sails on rivers of light. I've noticed the idea of propelling spaceships with lasers has been getting some coverage in the press of late and I should probably explain how that works and why it is an attractive option first. The big downside of rockets is that you have to carry all your fuel with you and that your final speed is strongly controlled by how fast your exhaust flies out the back. If you want to go as fast as your exhaust flies out, you need 63% of your ship to be fuel, and if you want to slow down at the end, you need it to be 86% fuel. To get to double that speed and back down again, you need to be 98% fuel and for triple, 99.75% fuel. What that actual speed is depends on what your fuel is. If it were just compressed gas, that's quite slow, like if you were an astronaut who lost anchorage and started spinning away from your ship. You could vent your air tanks in one direction and the rocket equation works just fine. Your propellant is leaving at about the speed of sound, about 300 meters per second. Of course you're mostly not fuel or air, but if you were 63% fuel by mass, you could get up to about the speed of sound, ignoring obviously that there is no sound in space. Our typical rocket fuels have exhaust velocities 10 to 20 times higher than that, meaning they could get you to that same speed of sound with the ship only being a small fraction fuel, about 5 to 10%. As you would imagine, you want the highest exhaust velocity possible with a rocket, because it is pretty much impossible to get to more than 4 or 5 times your exhaust velocity with any rocket. Again, getting to just triple the speed and back down again required 99.7% fuel ratio, or 400 parts fuel for every one part of ship and cargo. It gets even worse to get to 4 or 5 times that speed. So your ideal exhaust is photons or neutrinos or gravitons, things already moving at or near the speed of light, which is a million times faster than sound. A rocket that shoots light, or photons, out of the back is called a photon rocket, and you can build one at home as easily as you can one that operates using baking soda and vinegar, you just need a flashlight. And indeed, if you turned a flashlight on and tossed down an airlock it would begin accelerating off, but very, very slowly. A flashlight with two D-cell batteries in it might be able to emit 90,000 joules of light before dying, and as we know from Einstein's E equals MC squared, 90,000 joules is the equivalent of one trillionth of a kilogram's mass energy, or one nanogram. So it is great rocket fuel in terms of mass, though not terribly practical. If I had a box made of perfect meals that let me dump light in and it couldn't escape until I wanted it to, then a box with a kilogram of light in it, and yes photons do have mass in this context, which I then handed to an astronaut who weighed 100 kilograms including his suit, could use that one kilogram box of light to get up to about 1% of light speed. We can't box light up like that, but if we could, it would be a great fuel. And that's basically what makes antimatter or Kugelblitz black holes so ideal. However, they still have to obey the rocket equation, and of course rely on science we don't have yet, and maybe never will. However, we can actually make a better ship than those using just modern technology, and we do that by chucking the rocket equation out the window and just not having the ship carry fuel at all. Hit something with light and it reflects or absorbs that light. Photons it absorb transfer all their momentum to it. Photons it reflects transfer twice their momentum to it. This is how a solar sail works, but if you want any real speed and mass, you need to concentrate that light either with lenses or by using a laser, especially as you get further from the Sun. 
The force a laser exerts on a non-reflective object is just the power of the beam divided by the speed of light, double that if it is reflective. So if I want to exert a force of 1G, the equivalent of Earth gravity, on a 1 kilogram object, or about 10 newtons, I need about 1.5 gigawatts, which is about the power output of the Hoover Dam. That might sound rather outrageous, but when dealing with interstellar travel, it will turn out to be cheaper than the alternatives, and it means nothing inside a fusion economy, or a solar powered Dyson Swarm, or Kardashev 2 economy. Thinking of it in terms of hydrogen, and rounding down to assume low efficiency of fusion and laser generation, a 1.5 gigawatt laser would run through about a kilogram of hydrogen each day. Hydrogen, again, is the most abundant stuff in the Universe, so that while this is in some ways an insanely wasteful use of energy, you could run a trillion of these lasers for a trillion years without even putting a noticeable dent in Jupiter. And again, we were assuming we only get about 0.1% of the mass energy of that hydrogen turned into a laser beam. This is the idea behind Starshot, you lug some solar panels and a laser up into space and push a tiny probe with solar sails on it with that laser. Here's where we get problems though. First, it is not easy to keep a laser targeted on an object when it starts getting far away. It needs to stay on course quite precisely or the laser misses, and it is quite easy to get a tiny variation in speed. Your meal for instance does not have to bounce light straight backwards. Even a minuscule change of angle on that meal will bounce the beam off at an angle and give you a little lateral velocity. This is actually handy since it means ships can move other than just away from the beam, but even a tiny drift of a millimeter a second means an hour later your ship is 3.6 meters off to one side, and your laser flies past it if your sails aren't at least that wide. If your laser is light hours away, it won't even know it's missing you for hours, and it will take just as long before the laser is back on target. Second, laser beams are not infinite thin cylinders, they do spread out. For both reasons, the further you get from the laser, the bigger the sail you want to have, so you want your sail as thin as possible, preferably less than a micrometer thick, but we have a lot of problems going much thinner than that. Third, you need some way to slow down. Now you can just use the laser to get up to speed and fuel to slow down, which is handy but still not ideal. Nonetheless, you will always want two things on any laser sail ship. First, a very good GPS system. It helps to be able to calculate your position quite exactly and tell the laser where you are and where you will be whenever that message gets to them and the laser gets to you. Second, you always want some fuel to maneuver with on board because it means you can correct your position if you lose lock with that laser. The reserve air on your ship might do the job. Of course an obvious way to slow down presents itself. You have a laser on the other end that does the job, pushing back against you. Needless to say, something has to go build that first. Also, you probably have a maximum range you can realistically keep pushing at, where it just isn't viable to keep the laser on the sail or expand the sail further, so you probably want spots along the way that can pick up the job. Space stations between stars with their own lasers who can push on the ship to speed it up more or push back to slow it down. It's as simple as that. We'll walk through a fairly realistic case of this in a moment, but that's the basic idea. So let's do a few notes before that example. First is power supply. Near the Sun, obviously solar power is handy, no clouds or nighttime in space, it's always noon. You can beam power directly out to your distant relay stations, easier to keep a lock on something that isn't really moving much and can be quite large compared to a ship. But by preference you'd have local power generation, if you had fusion. If you did, you wouldn't use this for interplanetary travel because even the crappiest fusion reactor is going to let you get very high interplanetary speeds with a lot less hassle than lasers involve. Hydrogen, again, is the most abundant stuff in the Universe, and if they're offering an exhaust velocity of hundreds or thousands of times what chemical rockets offer, they just tend to be easier to work with. Either way, getting the power out there is a hassle, but it's a doable hassle. Second, laser beams diverge over distance, and the maximums allowed relate to wavelength, so blue light is better than red light, and ultraviolet is better than blue, whereas microwaves are worse by far than any of those. 
I mention this because you can use any type of photon you can reflect. Lower frequencies have other advantages though, since you need fairly sturdy mirrors to reflect ultraviolet light, whereas you can reflect or absorb microwaves with a metal mesh. That's why your typical microwave door is plastic with a mesh in it. The holes in the mesh are smaller than the microwave wavelength and keep it from getting through, thus allowing you to watch your food cook without your eyeballs exploding, which tends to ruin dinner. I should also note that you can bounce a beam back and forth several times and gain momentum each bounce, so when you are near a laser you can get more push than you'd expect. Of course beams tend not to stay together after many bounces and that's hard to do at a distance. You also don't have to use light at all, charged particles flying out of a particle accelerator and hitting a magnetic sail would work. So too would neutrinos if someone were to ever figure out a way to make a substance that could reflect them. You can also use that beam as your power source, you just have solar panels on the back not just meals. Absorbing the light to use it for power only gives you half the push reflecting does, but considering the beams need to have the power of the Hoover Dam to push a kilogram as hard as gravity does, you obviously don't need most of that, so you sip in a little and reflect most. Also as a note, while I'll be ignoring relativity when talking about speeds to save headaches, This still cannot be used to reach or exceed the speed of light. As you get up to those speeds, not only do you have to worry about all the travel hazards we discussed a couple weeks back in the Interstellar Travel Challenges episode, but your laser pushy on you is going to start redshifting, meaning it is getting weaker. You start getting up close to the speed of light, you'll be wondering why your nice big 200 gigawatt blue laser now appears to be a weak red 100 gigawatt laser, and if you keep going, Why does now a measly 1 megawatt microwave beam? Lastly, before we get to our fictional example, I want to emphasize that this method is not superior because it saves energy. It does, but who cares? Again, hydrogen is super abundant. It beats out chemical rockets in all respects, but beats out fusion and even antimatter or black hole starships in terms of maximum velocity. It lets you get faster on less energy, but it lets you get faster in general. Its maximum speed on a long enough chain, like one running across an entire galaxy, is whatever velocity that local chunk of space will allow before all the drag of the interstellar medium finally cancels out your acceleration from your increasingly weaker and redshifted beam. But if you have relays all along the way helping to clear out dangerous debris and pushing you along, 99% of light speed is doable with such a laser highway even higher if for some reason you need to slow down your onboard time enough to justify such a thing. Out in the intergalactic void where things are even thinner, and where trips would take millions of years, I could see justifying the power expense to push your speed up to ultra-relativistic speeds, so the trip only took a thousand years of your time even though you still arrived millions of years later. And yes, you could scale this system up to stretch between galaxies. Okay, on to our example. We've covered the science but I find using a hypothetical fictional example often helps to cement the idea. I'll return us to the one we used for the Life in a Space Calling trilogy, but we're back home at Earth. It's the year 2500 and mankind has a couple dozen or so interstellar colonies and has settled thousands of asteroids in our own system. The population in the solar system is a few trillion, and they've got fusion power and are slowly adding rotating habitats to a Dyson Swarm that so far is cobweb thin, not blocking even 1% of 1% of the Sun's light. Very little of the solar system's GDP is going into interstellar flight, we'll say 1% of 1%, the equivalent of $2 billion a year from the current US economy, but they're so much bigger and higher tech than us that such an expenditure still means they are building and equipping dozens of fusion-powered colony ships a few kilometers long and sending them out every year. Those ships only travel at a maximum of 20% of light speed, so even though they're spewing out massive arc ships, they've only got a couple dozen colonies that have actually arrived and sent home mission accomplished messages. Most are still en route, the ones that arrived all date back to when you only built maybe one ship a year. Of course some of those messages are saying hey, send more people, and others are saying hey, we've got some people who want to come home. So we go talk to the giant supercomputer named Deep Thought spawning over Mountain View, California at the former headquarters of Google, and we ask it if faster than light travel might be on the table. It says yes, it probably is, but it will need some time to think about it. 
We decide to go get lunch while the God Machine figures it out, and the TV reports as breaking news that Deep Thought has gone into very deep thoughts and says it will be busy for the next seven and a half million years, because some unidentified morons asked it to solve fast and light travel. So none of the other AIs will talk to us, and the various cyborged up transhumans all tell us to go take a hike. If they want to visit another solar system, they'll just send a digital copy of their own brain by radio at light speed. So we decide we're going to have to do this using fairly basic technology. At the dawn of the 26th century, you don't get to play with human level intelligence AIs or independent self-replicating machines if you don't get one of those to sign off on it. Not since the incident that resulted in unhinged Grey Goo turning Mars Moon Phobos into a quadrillions of paperclips. So we can't send out any pencil-sized tubes of self-replicating machines to impact into various interstellar rocks and turn them into entirely automated laser platforms. We are going to have to build it all ourselves, and our relays are going to have to be manned and when we talk to our engineering team, they tell us the real issue is making our relays close enough that they can clear out all the space junk. If we want ships slamming along at 90% of light speed, we need to have a big corridor millions of kilometers wide that we are constantly clearing of anything big enough to be visible to the naked eye. They also say they've got a great sail design made out of graphene that's 100 kilometers across and can reflect our lasers at up to 10 megawatts per square meter without melting. And a whole sail like that will only mass 1,000 tons, and they can target that easily a whole light week away. They say we can drop 50 stations spread out over a light year and they can keep a laser on a sail like that the whole way and keep those corridors clear of debris and space dust, so that they can do those speeds and that the corridor is wide enough that the millions of ships could be passing by at different speeds or in opposite directions without collision concerns. So we get them to design us a ship with some spare sail segments, a small fusion reactor and some fuel for maneuvering, and all that and the main hull will cost us 3,000 tons. We are going to go with a nice 10,000 ton ship design, 10 million kilograms. We could do bigger and slower, we could do smaller with smaller sails, but we are building to 10 million kilograms, the mass of a modern Ticonderoga naval cruiser. Very small by this channel's standards. I think our interstellar arc ship example, Unity, had shuttles bigger than that. This time around our ship isn't a big long cylinder or even a sharpened pencil, whose front cone shape helps bounce debris away, but is an outright cone. We are going fast. We want all the bounce we can get, and we are accelerating fast too, so we don't really need spin gravity, or at least if we do, we need a cone shape to let us merge that with the acceleration gravity the beam is providing. We don't have any massive artificial habitats that can't be easily moved around. There's some hydroponics and a few small gardens, but this is a passenger ship, not some huge colonial arc ship. We are also high tech, so if the ship's shape isn't ideal halfway through the trip, because we can't accelerate anymore, it will just stretch itself into a cylinder. It's the sort of ship where a thousand people could enjoy modestly comfortable personal cabins comparable to modern luxury cruise ships. You could pack more folks in, but this is still a journey of many years and living space isn't really a big constraint, mass is, so it's not about cramped cabins, more that the furniture is lightweight stuff. Our spare sail and fuel are packed up front, acting as shielding for the trip, along with all our spare air and water and supplies. The neat thing about our relay is that if something happens to us, we could adjust speeds enough that some other ship behind us could come up and take us on board. Indeed the relays might even be able to send us accelerated matter streams of oxygen or hydrogen if we needed them. So how about those stations and their lasers? First, let's talk power. If our 10 million kilogram ships are going to be pushed along at 1G, those lasers need to be 10 million times more powerful than the 1.5 gigawatt one we discussed for shoving 1 kilogram objects. That's 15 million gigawatts or 15 petawatts. So you know, the light hitting Earth from the Sun is only a bit over 10 times that, so we're talking about lasers that could provide noontime sunlight to an entire continent. They're also burning through 10 million kilograms of hydrogen a day, using our earlier figure. They could be getting that from home, an endless chain of massive freighters coming in slower stretching back to Jupiter, but interstellar space is lousy with giant icebergs so each station is probably built on one dragged at lower speeds to be on the chain, or it sends out swarms of smaller ships to mine its local area, 
After all, it has a whole light week, a value much bigger than our solar system all to itself. There's a huge amount of hydrogen gas floating around there, and it could just have collectors out past the corridor that sucked up hydrogen to be shot to the relay. But a single tanker the size of a modern oil tanker could dock every few months to replenish their needs. You could slap speed limits on your highway if fuel consumption got to be an issue, but even one small gas giant could fuel hundreds of these lines for longer than most stars live without being significantly reduced in mass. You might even use a slower matter stream down the corridor to supply fuel. You don't just move ships with such a highway, you can move atomic matter via particle accelerators and information too, since even modest lasers running between each relay can allow huge bandwidth transmissions with little signal loss. So 50 relays a light year, and we will say we've got a total of 2,000 light years worth of relays, going to all our neighboring stars inside about 20 light years. There's a bit over a hundred of them, giving us a decently round number of 100,000 relays, with a few hundred on each line on average. What are those relays like? Ships aren't really stopping at these places often. There's a sweet spot between fusion engines and laser sails, probably somewhere in between 10-20% to of light speed, so you might have slower ships just above that which stop from time to time. 1G of acceleration or deceleration will let you get up to or down from 10% of light speed in just over a month, or down from 20% in about two and a half months. So slower economy style ships, as it were, making slower trips might make layovers at them. They also might be fairly busy local ports for mining activity. In terms of size, they can be quite huge if they want to be. Again, they are running lasers strong enough to light a continent, so if they were only running them at night, they could be that big, lasering ships in their night cycle and using that juice during the day. These are non-moving objects, so they don't really need the kind of shielding the ships do. They also aren't going to be one big laser, more like an array of thousands of them, and so they could be a small swarm or string of rotating habitats serving as a home to a billion souls. Or they could be quite small, just a station of a few hundred thousand for maintenance and maybe using their excess power for lighting large force preserves or such. The other neat thing about a system like this is you can have shuttles. You need a big ship to ferry normal humans around for a decade, and again cyborgs or AIs can probably skip the whole thing in favor of traveling as data, so we might as well think normal humans. So you need a big ship for the whole journey but not for jumping around. A single person pod, or small ship for maybe a dozen, with a big sail could take a lot more than 1G of acceleration, so people could rendezvous with a ship or station by boarding such a shuttle and getting pushed up to or down from speed. The equivalent of a life pod might be some bare bones life support with a big sail designed for the maximum acceleration possible. As to constructing such a chain, you could build the relays by normal means or by using existing lasers to get out to the next location and slow down more conventionally, saving a lot of fuel. Once built they allow near light speed travel from system to system. On a sci-fi note, it actually allows for piracy, since folks could lurk in bases near the trail and come out in pirate ships and data. Those outposts are devastatingly heavily armed with the mega lasers, but that's only a good weapon at relatively close ranges since people can intentionally jink their ship around to avoid it, as we discussed in the Space Warfare episode. Okay, we'll leave off there for today. Those are interstellar highways a means of travel that requires no high technology but allow the best performance of any interstellar option currently allowed under known physics, even some that seriously bend it. I'd like to thank Stefan Blandin for making some of the excellent animations for this episode. I'm always grateful whenever anyone submits artwork for the channel to use, but this kind of custom tailored animation is the sort of thing that can take hours or even days to make and I really appreciate that. There are obviously no animations to use for something like this when even laser sails are still a pretty new idea, let alone some massive network like the one we discussed today. Next week we will be beginning our new series, Upward Bound, where we will come home to Earth in modern times and look at various launch assist systems that might let us get into space cheaply enough to start setting up the kind of interplanetary infrastructure you need to have before you can even contemplate something like the Interstellar Highway. Make sure to subscribe to the channel for alerts when that and other episodes come out, and if you enjoyed this episode, please like it and share it with others. Until next time, thanks for watching, 
and have a great week. 